First off, I'm very happy to be asked to, to speak uh, to this group. I've, I've spoken here before. I see some new faces. I thought, man, you get, the, the Rotary's getting younger and younger. And then it turns out you have a bunch of scholarship winners here. So <laughs> maybe not quite as younger and younger as I, as I thought, but I definitely see some new faces. Uh, I'm really, really um, pleased to be here when you're, when you're giving these scholarship acknowledgments as well as uh, allowing this young man to come up and talk about his Eagle Scout uh, project. Um, my son actually got a Rotary scholarship to, to college, not from this road, but this, this branch. Um, and he also was an Eagle Scout. So I know what the commitment is to, uh, to get that. I also know to get that scholarship, you actually have to study and you have to do all those activities you guys talked about, which is amazing. Um, so I, I, I um, am pleased to be here while you guys are being acknowledged because I think that's a, a great way I can lay it up for you. He is an Eagle Scout, so he's done. He's, he doesn't have to worry about it anymore. What, what age are you? I'm 17. 17, when's your birthday? This year? Next year? Next year. Okay, because I'm an Eagle Scout parent. I have a You guys are like, well, that's cool. Uh, summer's going fast. So you got a whole year. And I know that uh, uh, you're already planning it. You're on top of it. Don't drive your mother crazy. Get this thing done. Get into it. But, but it, sounds like, it sounds like you've got a, a good project um, going there. So, so. Uh, I'd be happy to be involved in some way with that as well. I think that that's a, a, a worthwhile uh, project and, and uh, appreciate being here when, when you guys have presented to the Rotary. I'm glad the Rotary is so uh, um, uh, willing and accepting to be a part of that project. So uh, you also said that you're thinking about being a lawyer. So uh, um, maybe I have some advice of that, which might, might be don't become a lawyer. But <laughs> uh, as I said, I was not an Eagle Scout. I was not a scholarship winner. Uh, so I'm a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and, uh, my, my practice is, is primarily criminal defense law uh, with a, a focus on OVI, what we call it Ohio OVI, but they call it everywhere else DUI defense. Um, so my, my presentation is uh, partially on um, what, the, what the OVI statutes are uh, and a little bit about, since we now have medical marijuana, has now been been um, authorized for the state of Ohio. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, medical marijuana as it relates to driving, um, and uh, just take any questions. So uh, my uh, my presentation can be as lengthy or as short as, as need be. So uh, on the, the the handout I gave you, I gave you there's three different there's actually 25 different ways you can be charged with DUI in Ohio, and that doesn't include folks who are, well it does include folks who are under the age of 21 whose legal limit is lower than, than the rest of us. So uh, if you're under the age of 21, uh, your legal limit is basically close to zero. Okay, your legal limit is 0 .02, which is, is the only reason they make it not zero is because that kind of is like the margin of error of a machine, although they don't want to acknowledge it. So you could actually, if you're a 0 .01, you may have no alcohol in your system um, and you can still register a, a .01. If you're um, an adult and you take a breath test, uh, if you test a .01, your test result could well be a .08. Your actual uh, um, blood alcohol could be a .08 to a .12, and that would be considered an accurate test. Um, and the state of Ohio doesn't like to acknowledge that, but they, we have several machines that are used for breath testing in the state of Ohio the newest one requires two tests, and those two tests have to be in agreement between 0.020. So if you test a 0.1 and you test a 0.15, that, the, the, the conclusion would be neither of those are accurate. We don't know what it is. There's something going on. Um, if you point out, test a 0.1 and a 0.08, then you're right on the legal limit because the legal limit is 0.08 for adults. Uh, and they will take the lower of those two tests. That's on the new machine that's called Intoxilizer 8000, which, by the way, is a piece of junk. So, so, so we don't use it in Franklin County. Uh, part of the reason we don't use it in Franklin County is because of me, because I've had other county judges say that that machine is inaccurate, and our city attorney, as you can look up the, the article, basically says that we're not getting it. Uh, he made a deal with the governor, so the rest of the state might use this machine, but the, the, 
uh, Franklin County is not using that machine because they don't want to govern up with the litigation. He said that uh, that we had a very uh, astute defense bar um, that uh, was his reason for for not wanting to, 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 to get involved with that machine. Um, but, so there's 25 different ways you can be charged with DUI. On, on the handle I gave you, there, I gave you the three ways you can be charged um, if you're um, a first offender and if you are, uh, it's only only related to alcohol, okay, not related to any other drugs. Uh, it, you know, basically you can be charged if you, um, there's no breath test, you can be charged with OVI, that's called OVI impaired. Uh, that's if there's no, no test whatsoever. If you uh, take a breath test, you are charged with two charges, OVI impaired and what we call OVI per se. That's an OVI with a breath test. They don't have to prove that you're impaired in any way, shape, or form to convict you of the OVI per se. If the, the number says you're a .081, then you, and they go to the jury and the jury believes that the result of that is accurate, you're guilty of OVI whether they have any evidence of, of, of impairment. In fact, what a lot of prosecutors will do is they'll dismiss the impaired charge and go forward on the breath test charge because then they try to keep me from talking about the fact that you weren't impaired and say, well, this person was not impaired in the least. They don't want me to get into that. So, so I have to use a little judo to get that information into the, uh, into the, the jury. Um, and there's appropriate times when I should be able to. So if, let's say I had a toxicologist who said, look, if this person was the level that this machine says, he should be have these different characteristics. They should be have difficulty with motor control. They should have difficulty speaking. And, uh, and so therefore, I don't believe this draft test is accurate. Um, and um, I had a case like that uh, in a trial in Dayton about five months ago, and the judge wouldn't let our expert talk about, he's an expert toxicologist, board certified, wouldn't let him talk about, look, I think this result is inaccurate because the person doesn't look impaired and they should look impaired. So we're on appeal on that one. Um, but uh, so that those are the basic kinds of charge you can have, the per se and the, and the OVI charge. Again, there's 25 different ways you can do it because you might have a prior, you might have uh, marijuana involved, you might have uh, uh, any, there's a number of drugs that can be involved on the, the printouts because it would have been taking up too many pages. Um, there, if you go to my website, uh, our firm just completed uh, a website, our website with a lot, a lot of OVI information, including all the penalties. So if you happen to have a friend who gets pulled over and they've got a prior and you want to know how much, what kind of penalties they're facing, you can go on there. It lists all of those different 25 different offenses and what those, what the actual penalties are. It also discusses the different types of evidence that they can use against you in, in an OVI case. Obviously, with 20 minutes, I'm not going to go through all of that. Um, uh, I do want to talk about medical marijuana. Um, I, I know that the young people in this room don't have to worry about medical marijuana or marijuana use, so we, we're not talking to you, uh, but we are talking to your friends because uh, when we have, when we found that the state decriminalized marijuana, basically made marijuana, anything, anything less than 100 grams was a minor misdemeanor. Uh, young people, and maybe some old people, thought that, well, that means it's no big deal. That marijuana, having marijuana and possessing marijuana is not a big deal. Uh, you can do that, it's non-criminalized, so you won't get in trouble. Well, that's not correct. If you, uh, if, even if you have a minor amount of marijuana, and you're, uh, and you're charged with it, you can get your license suspended for having that minor amount of marijuana. So just possession of a minor amount of marijuana still is a significant offense and a significant penalties. Uh, so if you have kids who you might suspect are, are uh, involved in, in, in the, the marijuana, and I think, I think eventually we'll have recreational use marijuana in Ohio. Right now we have medical marijuana. Um, and the, um, the problem with all that is, is in particular, our OVI laws are horrible when it's related to marijuana. So I told you about the per se alcohol, where it says that if you're test over an 08, uh, then you're guilty of an OVI, whether you're impaired or not. Well, at least there we're testing for alcohol. And at least there's some consensus that at a certain level of alcohol, a person is impaired. Uh, for the marijuana um, community. So with medical marijuana, people are legally 
entitled to get marijuana and take it for a medical condition. Now, the reason they passed that originally was they were worried about that uh, referendum where they were actually trying to make personal use and, and, and all that stuff legal. So the legislature, I have lots of friends in the legislature, and they, they said, point blank, yeah, we, we passed this because we didn't want it to go whole hog, so we wanted to get medical marijuana that might keep that, that, that process from going forward. Um, but once they did it, the people who became involved with the state, the Department of Commerce, who regulates the sales, the Department of uh, the, the um, Medical Board, who regulates the uh, um, doctors, and the uh, Pharmacy Board, really, really tried to make it designed towards people who have uh, injuries or illnesses that would be uh, potentially helped by the marijuana. So they really, really looked at these people and said, these people are patients, we want to find ways we can help these patients. Uh, and they did, but what they have done is, because they didn't change our Ohio, um, our Ohio DUI laws related to marijuana. So what they basically made was a bunch of criminals. Because, uh, and, I, and, and I actually drafted legislation through the Ohio State Bar Association, which is gonna be proposed to the legislature, whether it goes through or not, I don't know, but I talked to um, some of the legislators and I said, look, would you support a law that says anybody who has a medical marijuana card is guilty of OVI 24-7. And they said, well, of course not. Of course not. They said, well, that's what you did. Or that's what we have. Because what they test for in marijuana, and I have that in your, in your handout, have the levels. What they test for is the metabolite for marijuana. So the metabolite is basically the waste product after someone uses marijuana. It's what goes through their system and it, it's what stays in your system. It's not active in any way, shape, or form. If someone tests 100 nanograms uh, uh, of, of, of THC uh, metabolite in their blood or urine, there's no <coughs> toxicologist in the world who's gonna say that that means they're impaired. They're gonna say that means nothing from a medical's perspective. That means nothing, we don't know. Um, if they test and they actually test for THC, there, most, most of the experts, even the government experts, say, look, there's no level of THC where we can say the person's impaired because it also builds up. So it's not like alcohol is, is, is the main thing. But our current medical marijuana, our current marijuana DUI law basically simply says, if you have a really small amount of the marijuana metabolite in your urine or in your blood, you are guilty of DUI, whether you're impaired or not. In fact, it's, it's irrelevant whether you're impaired or not. So we're trying to change that statute to make it basically that there's a presumption you're impaired, but you can overcome that by showing evidence that, that you weren't. So uh, word to the wise, you know, if you have kids and you think they might have anything to do with marijuana, tell them don't smoke marijuana or whatever you want to tell them. But definitely tell them don't smoke marijuana in your car because you know, someone smokes marijuana in their car, they think this is a safe place, I can go park over here, I can smoke my pot. It's getting the odor of marijuana, it's getting in, into the interior of that car. That's called probable cause. As Soon as an officer pulls them over, if they smell marijuana, it doesn't matter if they smoked it three days ago, whatever, that gives them probable cause to now start getting you out of the car and asking for a urine test or a blood test, and that, you know, that's the road towards that, towards that uh, you know, then they say, okay, well, you had this in your urine, so you're, you're guilty. And the kid says, well, I, I, wasn't, I, hadn't, drunk, I hadn't smoked for a month. And it can stay in your system for 30 days or more, actually. I had a doctor who's in the system for like 100 days. Um, but the reason for him was he was trying to, to get it out of his system, and he was being looked at by the medical board, and he was losing weight. And the marijuana metabolite stores in your fat cells. So as you lose weight, you're releasing more of this the, 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 this uh, metabolite that's been in your system. So, um, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, if you want to you want to avoid having to pay me, um, you know, for your kids, tell them don't smoke marijuana in their car. Uh, don't be uh, having marijuana paraphernalia laying out on their dashboard or in their you know, anywhere in the in the compartment of the car because again, that's probable cause. Uh, they may not have smoked that day. They may not, it might be their buddies. It's a, always, it's their friend. My friend left that in there. Well, your friend didn't get arrested, but you are, okay? So, um, so whenever I get any young person 
in my office for any, you know, no matter what they're there for, I always give them this speech because, you know, you don't need uh, a marijuana related OVI charge, uh, you know, that you have to fight. You don't need a marijuana possession charge on your license because if your license gets suspended because you had a minor amount of marijuana, that goes in your driver's license as a drug related suspension. Mm. Who needs that? And that can actually affect your scholarships and that can affect that kind of stuff. So get the word out to your friends that, that, that marijuana, even though we have medical marijuana, uh, it's still viewed as a serious offense if you're not a medical marijuana card holder. And secondarily, if you are a medical marijuana card holder, you still have to worry because what we test for right now uh, basically makes you a criminal if you get pulled over for, for OBI. That's my spiel for 20 minutes. If any questions, I can, I can handle them. Um, so let's say I've had one or two drinks and I've got the cops behind me and I can't outrun them. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to, by the way. That's not the thing to do. Uh, what, what should I do when I get pulled over if I can't trust the breathalyzer? You know, so, so, um, the advice, so, so a lot of lawyers will give you this advice, which is absolutely wrong. Um, the, the advice they'll give you is roll down your window this far, put your license out, out the window, and just do that, okay? And hypothetically, that's okay under our Constitution. You don't have any duty to, you know, but if you do that, then the officer is probably going to be yanking you out of the car. Um, you know, if he has to have some some reason but he's going to be looking a little harder at you the reason the, the lawyers who usually give that advice are prosecutors and judges the reason for that is they never have to live with that advice okay so something that happens to their client they don't have a client right and the other reason that it works really good for them is it stops people asking them correct questions at parties i'm happy to answer the questions at parties but they but they, they don't want to answer that those questions no one will take that advice i mean who's going to do that Right? Who's going to put their? I mean, you have to be. If, you, if you're really, really hammered, you you might figure out. Remember to do that. But most of us are law-abiding citizens. We want to cooperate with the police to some extent. Uh, I advise you to cooperate with them, but not give up your constitutional rights. And your constitutional rights are you don't have to do anything. So my recommendation to people is, you know, basically this is where you take the notes. My my recommendation is when you because I just had a case. I have a case where the client did field sobriety tests. She passed the walk and turn test, or she passed the one leg stand test. She passed the alphabet test where they basically say, I want you to start at F and end at Y, don't sing. Okay? We've not, none of us have ever done that before, but she passed that. <laughs> On the walk and turn test, she had, there's, they're only looking for two clues. Two clues out of eight clues. Um, and on that test, uh, she had four clues. We looked at them. We think two of those clues were, were, were wrong. The officer basically he said that she turned improperly. What they're supposed to instruct is you stand like this. When you get to the end of your nine steps on the walk and turn, you should turn, keep your front leg on the line, take a series of small steps, and turn back. So our client stopped here. She took a step here. She took like this. And then she did this. And the officer said, no, that's not a proper turn. So... <laughs> And the officer said, his testimony was, if you have two clues on the walk and turn test, this is in front of a judge, we're having motions to suppress. If you have two, two terms, two clues on the walk and turn test, there's a high likelihood you're under the influence. Now that's not what the actual manual says, but he said it and that's what he'd say in front of a jury. So my question is, okay, so if any of these jurors or any of you folks had more than two clues on the walk and turn test, then that means there's a high likelihood that you're under the influence, even though I'm sitting there watching you guys all day long and you don't seem you don't seem impaired. So the bottom line is you don't want to do those tests. I mean, if you're if you're in perfect physical condition uh, and you do the one leg stand and the walk and turn test properly, they're going to do an eye test where they look for something in your eye that you can't see happening, and there's no video that's going to show whether they see it or not. And if they are already asking you to do that test, they probably think you're under the influence. So they may see something that's not there. Um, so what I tell people to say, say is, look, I'm willing to do your test. I want to have them cooperative. Uh, first thing you do, if an officer pulls you over, turn your car off. Put your keys in your pocket, put your phone in your other pocket, okay? Um, when they tell you to get out of the car, you get out of the car. They say, I'd like you to do some field sobriety tests. You say, I'm, a, I'm agreeable to do your test because I, I think I'm fine, but I'd like to have an independent witness present. 
because you're going to be judging me. I'd like someone independent present. They'll never give it to you. Uh, and then you can say, if you remember, preferably a lawyer. <laughs> and, and now you're telling them, hey, I'm not as stupid as you think I am. But I'm going to be cooperative. I guarantee you, I'll put $100 on the table. Uh, um, I guarantee you this is what they're going to say next. They're going to say, well, sir, I just need to make sure you're okay to drive. Okay, and by make sure you're okay to drive, what he means is, I need to make sure you can do these, these field sobriety tests perfectly, and I'm going to keep doing them until you flunk one. Because I do those three tests, and then, okay, how, here's the alphabet test. Okay, can you count backwards from, uh, for me from 59 to 43? And most people go past 43 because they get in the rhythm, okay? And, and, and then there's other tests I'll have you do. So what he's basically saying is, I, you will have to show me you are so sober that if Mad later sees a video of this arrest, and I didn't arrest you, and something later happened, I'm okay. That no one's going to blame me for not arresting you. I mean, that's the, 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 you know, they're, they're on a pedestal now. So you say, when he says, I need to make sure you're okay, you say, officer, I think I'm fine to drive, but I know you have a hard job to do. Here are my car keys. Tell me where you want me to come get those tomorrow. I'm calling my brother to come pick me up. I think I'm fine, but I don't want you to have to be in that position. That's your best chance. Because if he, after that, he says, well, what he'll, what he, what he, he may say is that's not going to happen. Oh, then it's not that you want to make sure I'm okay to drive. You want to gather some evidence. You don't say that. Yeah. You just say, look, I think I'm fine. Here's, here's my keys. Tell me where you want me to pick you up to pick those up tomorrow. And I've had clients who've done that, who've said, call me up and say, hey, that worked. Because you're not doing the field sobriety test. Now look, if you get out of the car and you fall down while you're getting out of the car or you bark at the moon, or you, you hand them your credit card instead of your driver's license. <laughs> you know, those kinds of things where it's clear before you even do the field sobriety test that you're impaired, um, then it ain't gonna work. I and mean, that's not gonna happen. I know that I cannot walk a straight line. Right. Stone sober. <laughs> not the end of our <laughs> Well, I mean, the funny thing is, when you say walk a straight line, and you're not just walking a straight line. What you're doing is they'll say, okay, I want you to stand like this. I want you to stand in this position, just right here, one foot in front of the other, heel to toe, while I give you some instructions. And then while I give you those instructions, it takes, I can't do that for more than you know, a few seconds. It takes up to a minute or more while they're giving you these instructions, you're standing like this. I and can't if you, do that. And if you simply did this, well, I, you know, that's kind of uncomfortable. I'm going to shuffle my feet to here. That's one clue. Remember, you get two. Or you don't get two. You can only, it only takes two. The next clue, okay, so you're going to walk heel to toe. It has to be absolutely heel to toe. If you spread it more than a half inch when you're doing that walk, then that's another clue and you're done. If you step off the line, and, and it's an imaginary line, it's not a real line. So he, the officer gets to decide how wide the line is. That's always fun in the motion here. You say, officer, how wide was your line? Because her line, see, I think she was on it. Um, and then again, if you, if you raise your hands for balance, that's a clue. You're gone. If you so if you want to make a series of fall, small steps, you do this, you come back. Uh, again, if you raise your hand on any one of those things, that's a clue. Uh, if you start, if you're sitting there and you're nervous, and the officer says, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have you walk nine heel of toe steps, you go, Okay, I'm great at that. And you start doing it, because oh, you started before I told you to start. That's a clue. So you're right. I mean, even if you, even if you, I mean, unless you practice these things, how can you do them? So my advice is. Hey, I'd be willing to do them, but I'd like to have an independent person present, preferably a lawyer. They're I, never going to give that to you. I can't just tell them up front I can't do that. Well, you know, if, if, here, I hate to say it, I hate to be sexist, but Go ahead. It's, not really, it's not really anti sexist. Women have, when that, women have a much better response, and that better response is my husband told me never to do these games. No one's ever going to question him if your husband told you. He must know something. You don't want to say, hey, that DUI lawyer at Rotary told me never to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even you say, you know what, my husband told me. I, I had a client who they said, I want you to get, ma'am, I want you out of the car. And she goes, hey, buddy, my husband told me never to get out of the car. Who, I don't know if you're, I, I think you're really a police officer, but I'm not sure. And then he says, well, ma'am, I'm a police officer, and if you don't get out of the car, I'm going to drag your ass out. Okay, she got out. And she said, I want you to do these field sobriety tests. My husband told me never do field sobriety tests. And, and he goes, well, why not? I don't know. Ask my husband. He told me never to do those. That case didn't go too far, just so you know. That was, that, that was you know, she did everything. I mean, that's, so, you know, I mean, in, in, a, in a, 
uh, in a sexist society, jurors are okay if you want. She, her husband told her. Not to do that. I mean, I'm not going to blame her for that, right? So, kids, maybe say, my dad told me never to do that. I don't know. Can you save it for questions? Sure. Tim, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.